we stand in a very special place. I was talking to the dean about this a few moments ago. My daughter and, and son-in-law graduated just over there from the law school a couple of years back. And, and when you sit and look out over the Pacific Ocean from this venue, there's nothing like it in the world. And I, I've traveled all over the world. Uh, it, it's pretty unique. And, and to have a Frisbee golf hole in the middle of your graduation while you're looking over the, the Pacific Ocean, it doesn't get better than that. And so, you know, they can take the, the Ivy League and the, the Ivy covered, you know, brick walls and that sort of thing back east and beautiful, but nothing beats Pepperdine and uh, nothing beats this, this beautiful state we're in. And, and to match the, the beauty of the, the location, the prestige of the school is really increasing. It gets higher and higher every year uh, due to you, the students uh, recruiting and, and the faculty that's here. And, uh, and at some point you're going to get a graduation speaker that's commensurate with that high quality, but and, and until then you've got to deal with me. So, but to the class of 2023, congratulations. And if you take nothing else away from what I talked to you about today, do me one favor. When this is over, go find your spouse or your partner, your parents, your siblings, your friends who supported you, uh, some financially, some morally, uh, some helping you with your work. Thank them for, for their support and get you this degree. It's a huge accomplishment for you, but it's an accomplishment that's shared with them. So, so please uh, spend spend a few minutes afterwards and, and you know give you, express your gratitude to them. Now, I, I've attended a few graduations over the years, uh, a couple of my own. I, I can't remember what any of the speeches said. I, I don't remember any of the counsel I received. I, that that's on me, not on the speakers. I'm sure. Uh, I, I do remember some very long speeches and. Uh, especially sit down in the sun. I was at UCLA down the it was a small public school down the street from here. Uh, our, our graduation was in June. It was hot. Uh, and it was a long speech. I forget who gave it. and I forget what they said. All, all I can remember is I was boiling in my, my uh, robes. So they give me 10 minutes. I'm going to try and keep it to eight. Uh, but I'm a litigator, so it's a little hard to do that as, as a trial lawyer. So uh, I like country music. And some of you may have heard of a, a singer, Tim McGraw. He released a song in 2015. It was written by a woman named Lori McKenna. And the title of the song is Humble and Kind. Have any of you ever heard that song? Some of you have heard it. Okay, it's gonna be played on the radio for a long time. Excuse me, it's gonna be streamed for you under 40 for a long time. And, and Tim wasn't the first to give that advice by any means. Uh, and, uh, but he, he put it to nice lyrics and, uh, and, and a great tune. And so it's the title of Tim's song that's a counsel I'm going to share with you today. And uh, your career and your life will be better, will be, will be much better if you consider his counsel and, and, and implement it along the way. I was on a presidential campaign a few years back. Now, I've done a lot of presidential campaigns. Almost all of my candidates have lost. So if you ever see me endorse a candidate, short them. And, and it's, uh, uh, but that's another story. But after one of the debates, this was several years ago, a couple of cycles back, we were at a primary debate. It was at the Reagan Library up the, the street from here. And uh, the, the debate was over, and I was standing with a governor from down south. And the governor mentioned to me about one of the candidates. He said, that guy's a turtle on a post. And it's like, I like country music, but I, I don't speak southern. <laughs> and so the governor explained it to me. He says, when you see a turtle on a post, you know he didn't get there himself. Someone put him there. And uh, I thought that was kind of funny. It's kind of like saying, you know, someone was born on third base and thought she hit a triple. Uh, now, I like the turtle on the post quip, especially considering that I, of course, was a totally self-made person. And so I, I understood what the governor was talking about. But, but, but the, the older I've gotten, and, and having sat down the, in the office next to the guy with, on the tallest post in the world, uh, I've come to realize we're all turtles on post. I mean, every one of us. And whatever measure of success we've achieved in our life, including your Pepperdine master's degree today, as I said at the beginning, it's, it's the result of not just us, but of a lot of helping hands. And uh, as you rise, rise from post to higher post, and you will, especially with this degree, express your gratitude for the people that assisted you along the way. I mean, I wouldn't be the national security, or I wouldn't have been the national security advisor if it wasn't for my wife, Lil Marie, my parents, my family, friends, mentors like Governor Pete Wilson or, or Hugh Hewitt, uh, among many others. So I think recognizing, when we go back to Tim's song, I think recognizing the hand of others in our work is really the essence of humility. And so 
uh, tell, you, tell you a couple of war stories that maybe emphasize a point. Uh, many people believe that my sole job as the hostage envoy, the special presidential envoy for hostage affairs, was getting ASAP Rocky out of a Swedish jail. Now, okay, you guys are going to have to, the graduates are going to have to explain to your parents and your grandparents who ASAP Rocky is. They, they have no idea what I'm talking about. Uh, I didn't either, that's another story, but. Uh, <laughs> But we got him home, and, and a few months ago, his mom called out of the blue uh, to say thank you for, for having helped get ASAP home quickly uh, and, and his colleagues who were with him. And, and it meant a lot to me, and I thought that was a, that, you know, didn't hear, didn't hear from ASAP. He was busy with Rihanna, but I did hear from his mom. <laughs> and that's a testament to moms. And, that's, uh, and, and it was very kind of her. But we did get a few other people out during the time that I was a hostage envoy, and one of them was a guy named Danny Birch, an American oil worker had been taken hostage in Yemen. It was in very difficult circumstances and captivity in that war-torn country. And the president welcomed Danny back to the America in the Oval Office. It was back on March 6, 2019. And it was broadcast on all the networks and the president and the vice president and others who were there were, were very kind. They acknowledged me on national TV. My mom loved that. Uh, but I knew that Danny was free because the Crown Prince of the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, had undertaken an operation to liberate him. And uh, I was also aware from a long career in, in government that the United States asks a lot from our allies and partners, but when they do things for us, we don't always go back and thank them. So I explained to the, the president the Crown Prince's role and, and also the role of his ambassador in Washington, Yosef Oteba, in getting Danny home. And the president sent out a personal tweet uh, thanking him, which, which was terrific. And then I got on a plane and I flew to Abu Dhabi. It was a long, long flight, but I wanted to go thank the Crown Prince in person. I express my appreciation to Mohammed bin Zayed for what he'd done for America. For me, as the hostage envoy, getting me on TV so my mom could see me with the, sitting next to the vice president in the Oval Office on the couch, and, but also for Danny, most, most importantly for Danny to bring him home. And we had a terrific visit at his palace. Those visits go late at night in the Middle East, and he actually has a, his own Kentucky Fried Chicken uh, restaurant in, in the palace, uh, <laughs> which is pretty cool. If I don't know, that, that may not be public. Uh, so don't, don't tell anyone that. And his younger brother, Sheikh Taknoon, was there. And Sheikh Taknoon was the UAE's national security advisor. Now, what I couldn't have known then uh, is that I would soon to become, very shortly thereafter, the United States national security advisor. And, and one of the most important things we did, and one of the things I'm, I look back, and, and I hate to use the word proud in a, in a talk, you know, styled humble and kind, but what I'm proud of, and American can be proud of, are the Abraham Accords. And I spent time with Jared Kushner and the President and Secretary Pompeo negotiating with, among others, Tak Noon and, uh, and the Crown Prince uh, to, to get those accords done, to bring peace to the Middle East. And, and one of the things that helped me was the relationship that we had that was built off that trip to the UAE, the, the, the trip to Abu Dhabi, which was a long trip to say thank you to someone. That paid dividends in a big way. And a, a, small, a small thing turned into a big thing. Now, in those same negotiations, I learned a lesson in humility from someone who's not normally associated uh, with that term, uh, Israeli Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu. Now, Bibi has walked on the world stage for nearly three decades. He's a giant of a, of a man, controversial. Some people love him, some people don't love him. Uh, but at the time we were negotiating the Abraham Accords, he was locked in a tight battle for election. Uh, big campaign in Israel. In fact, I think they had three campaigns. And we needed him to forgo a, what would have been a very popular political move for him and his party in Israel to keep the peace process on track. And I was tasked with making the ask. And so I, I sat down with this famous prime minister, 20 years my senior. Again, it was another late night. That's how those negotiations tend to work when you're dealing with the Middle East. And we were in Blair House, uh, the guest house of the United States across from the White House. And rather than focus on the person who was making the request to him or raise the possible consequences to his reelection, uh, or say, why isn't the president here asking? The prime minister made a courageous call. And we signed the Abraham Accords at the White House on September 15th, 2020. And Prime Minister Netanyahu made peace, but he lost his election. That was a, a real lesson in humility to me. Now, the good news for Prime Minister Netanyahu is that the Israeli voters returned him to the prime minister's office, and he's, a, he's again the prime minister. Uh, but there are lessons in some of those uh, some of those, less, uh, some of those uh, experiences that I think we can all benefit from. Now listen, 
humility also has a way of being foisted upon us. So sometimes your, your wife or your family or your kids, your parents, the media will uh, impose a little humility on you. And it's not always fair. But when it happens, you know, take it with a smile, show grace. Uh, the day I was appointed to be the National Security Advisor was out here in Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, the head, there was a headline, it was my only headline on the New York Times that day, ever, uh, was it read, uh, Robert O'Brien looks the part, but has spent little time playing it. So, welcome to the job. Now the article was actually, it was pretty positive, but I still get ripped about it today. And if you Google me, the first thing that pops up on Google is, looks the part, but has spent little time playing it. No Abraham Accords, no Serbia, Kosovo, peace deal, no hostages home, but uh, that. And then Stephen Colbert got in the act that night and uh, he said, the president announced my appointment, quote, in Los Angeles, which explains why the guy looks like the second male lead on suits. <laughs> I, I, I Googled that the other day. There have been, there have been a million five YouTube hits on that. <laughs> uh, so uh, again, all you can do is laugh or smile. But let me turn to kindness. When we think about kindness, sometimes it's the smallest acts that we remember most over the course of a lifetime. Let me give you an example that again happened in the White House. When Ambassador Rick Grinnell was leaving his job as the acting director of national intelligence, and Ambassador Grinnell is a fellow Californian, a lot of you know him, he looked forward to doing what cabinet secretaries get to do. They're in the cabinet room next to the White House, next to the Oval Office in the White House, every cabinet secretary gets a chair, and their, their name is put on a little plaque on the chair, and that's where they sit uh, in designated order. And when you leave the cabinet, you get to take the cabinet chair with you as a souvenir kind of a cool souvenir. Now, Rick was our first openly gay cabinet secretary. And so this momentum, momentum really meant a lot for him, and he wanted to bring it back to California. But unfortunately, the White House has a tradition that acting cabinet secretaries, as opposed to nominated and confirmed cabinet secretaries, don't get to take their chair with them. And I had to tell Rick that, uh, and a good friend who was a little disappointed. But President Trump heard about the matter. And he asked me to bring Rick down to the Oval Office on his last day as DNI, which I did. We, we used to brief the president in the Oval Office regularly two, three times a week. And Rick and Gina Haspel and I would do the briefing. And we got to the Oval Office, and Rick's chair was there with a bow on it. The president had changed the rule. And he even paid for the chair. And that, that was a courtesy that I think Rick will never, Ambassador Grinnell will never forget his entire life. And so we, too, have opportunities with our family, at home, with our friends, with our classmates, with our colleagues at work, and, and perhaps most importantly, with strangers, people we don't even know, to, to engage in acts of kindness, to, to lift people up, to make their lives a little bit better. But let me make clear about one thing. Showing humility and demonstrating kindness it does not equate to weakness or wokeness. It's a show of confidence, and it's a show of strength. On October, it was the evening of October 26, 2019, I sat in the White House Situation Room. I was there with the President, the Vice President, and the leaders of our military. And we watched in real time as our special operators, our special forces executed a flawless raid deep behind enemy lines in Syria on the hideout of ISIS founder Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Now my wife's a, a, an animal lover, so she wanted me to mention Conan, the, the hero dog, was with him. Uh, Conan, as maybe you recall, played a key role in that raid. Now, Baghdadi was the world's most wanted man, and he was a vicious, cruel terrorist. Uh, he'd killed thousands of people, thousands of Yazidi minorities. He'd put people into sexual slavery. He was a, a despicable person. And he'd killed four Americans, aid workers and, and reporters, uh, Jim Foley, Stephen Sotloff, Peter Kasich, and Kayla Mueller. And I knew all their families. Uh, they'd, they'd perished before I became the hostage envoy. But one of the things that President Trump told me is, bring their remains home. You know, we, we couldn't get them back alive, but they can rest in peace here in America. So I got to know their families. Unfortunately, we still haven't been able to get them home, but we will. But Kayla's case was especially heartbreaking, given how this young college graduate and aid worker had been treated by Baghdadi prior to her murder. And so as the operation conclu concluded, we got a radio transmission from the ground. And it, it was, you know, I can't go into all the details, but we could, it was kind of Tom Clancy as we could watch what was happening on, on these screens that the, the military brought into the sit room. And the commander on the ground wanted us to know that the name of the task force was 814. Now, that only makes sense when you know that Caleb, Caleb Miller's birthday was August 14th. And it was this humble call sign that our special operators 
sent a message to Kayla's parents, Carla and Marcia, that their daughter, but also our, our, our daughter, America's daughter, someone your age, that we hadn't forgotten about her. And that, and that we're gonna, we weren't gonna forget about her until we bring her home eventually. Now those soldiers also sent a message to those that would do us harm, that they're gonna be held accountable. And what a, what a message of humility and kindness and strength that this task force gave. And nor, normally the military loves these, uh, you know, uh, call signs like vengeance sword and uh, you know, wrathful justice and that sort of thing. And, and they're great, I, I like those too. But, uh, but I thought 814 was a sign of humility. Now graduates, you've got my congratulations. Uh, you've completed your studies, it's been rigorous, it's been hard, it's been financially difficult for many of you. But you're gonna embark on successful careers. You're gonna change the world, you're gonna change our country. And uh, the nation's gonna be a better place because of you. But as you do so, remember Tim McGraw's words, be humble, be kind, be strong. May God bless you all, may God bless the United States of America, and, and thank you very much for the opportunity to spend today with you. Thank you, God bless.